Diamond City really is a sprawling place. There are many homes, rooms, and shops that are easy to miss. One of them is the Science Center. We find the Science Center while walking across the catwalk just next to Travis's trailer to Diamond City Radio. Above the door, we see a big atom nucleus thing. We can then head on inside the Science Center. Professor, I have a new theory about how the Institute makes the synths. Oh no. We've been talking about this, remember? After last time, the shouting, me sleeping on the cold floor of the lab for three nights. That was your choice. And seriously, growing synths from the ground using recombinant plant nuclei? I mean, how could they even? Ah, uh ha! -huh. You do want to talk about it. Ah, uh, oh look, we have a visitor. Dr. Duff, dear. If you could bother them while I walk away from this conversation. Hi there! Are you here for today's free biology lesson? Biology lesson? That's right. Usually the kids from the schoolhouse are the first to drop by, but I don't see why I can't start the lesson with you. Biology? No, not even. Oh, well, if you're not, um, <laughs> I guess I'll just get back to the lab then. <sighs> sure, sounds fun. Yes, love that enthusiasm. As long as it's free. Why wouldn't it be? Let's get started. Now, we all talk about radiation like it's a single thing, but it's actually a term referring to dozens of different ionizing rays. You have X-rays, beta rays, gamma rays, but which one are we most worried about? The one most associated with the big old bombs 200 years ago? Beta rays. No, nope, not quite what we're looking for. X-rays. No, nope, not quite what we're looking for. Who gives a crap rays? No, nope, not quite what we're looking for. Gamma rays? That's right. Now, gamma rays are bad. Really bad. If your body absorbs too much of that kind of radiation, you'll suffer from fatigue, anemia, even death. But some life forms have been living with gamma radiation exposure for two centuries now, and they've adapted. Neat, huh? No, it's horrible. You might think that, but the key thing to remember is that life is always reacting to its environment. Otherwise, it dies. You are one huge nerd. I, for one, take that as the highest compliment. Science teaches us the lessons we need to survive, now more than ever. Yes, very interesting. That's what science is all about. Nothing stays the same. Everything reacts. What kinds of things have adapted to radiation? Oh, that's the perfect segue into the field trip portion of the lesson. Are you ready? Field trip? That's right. You go out, do some science of your own, and come back. I usually have a prize for the best junior scientist, which I guess is just automatically going to you. What do you say? I don't know about this. You're gonna go out and find a bloat fly gland. You see, the oversized bloat fly of today evolved from an earlier species of a smaller fly. Radioactive adaptation has resulted in a unique gland that enables it to balance and maintain speed despite its size. So what do you say? Ready to go out and dissect one? No way. I'm not hunting flies. Oh, well, everything was kind of building up to the... Never mind. Um... I should get back to the lab. What did you need me to do again? Go out, find yourself a bloat fly, collect a gland, and get back here to get the rank of junior scientist! Up for it? I do a job. I get paid. This isn't about money. This is about science! You gotta do it for the love of exploration! I do a job. I get paid. Money? Oh. Um, how about, uh, 125 caps? We're talking hunting a giant mutated bug. There's risks. That would explain why some students don't come back. How about 150 caps? I need more. For science. Well, if it's for science, 200. Get the blowfly gland. Got it. Remember, bring the gland back in one piece. Oh, and don't chew on it. One of the students got horribly sick because of that mistake. Well, okay, so looks like we've got a task ahead of us. Dr. Duff walks off. Her lab is sparsely decorated. It's basically just a big rectangular room with a bunch of crafting stations. In one corner, we see Skara's terminal, but it looks like they'll get angry if we read it. We'll come back to this. Heading upstairs, we find Professor Skara. Excuse me, Professor Skara? Dr. Duff handles all the visitors. Bother her. Despite my recommendations, the city allows anyone to use our equipment. Feel free. 
I'm in the middle of a million things. I have to stay focused. Please, the research I do here is delicate. Stay out of my way. She just doesn't want to have anything to do with us. This loft level appears to be their bedroom. We see some chems on a table, mentats of course, lots of science going on, and a single bed in the middle of the platform. Looks like Dr. Duff has gotten up and walked away, giving us the perfect opportunity to hack Skara's terminal. Now we do find a passcode for this terminal on Skara's inventory. We could always kill her or pickpocket her instead of hacking this terminal. Inside we find three entries. They appear to be Skara's diary entries, and the first one, number 23, spent the better part of the day trying to fix that aggravating noodle robot, but I can't figure out how to replace the Japanese language subroutines. Whoever wired that pile of junk did quite a shoddy job. I've already wasted three mnemonic attenuators trying to create a bypass, so I'll have to go scrounging for more. At least that will lead me as far from Duff's incessant prattle as possible. Oh, sounds like Professor Skara is not a big fan of Dr. Duff. Makes you wonder why they work out of the same shack together. In the next one, entry 27, Duff continues to try my patience. For the upteenth time, she left one of her experiments on top of my lab bench, allowing its contents to ooze all over everything I was working on. I swear, she has it in for me. If her laboratory hadn't contained all of the gear I need for my projects, I never would have agreed to stay in the first place. I wonder what exactly she's working on. People don't just do science. Is she working for a faction? The city? What science is she exactly doing? In the next one, number 35, everyone's talking about the giant Brotherhood of Steel airship that arrived in the Commonwealth. I'm not certain why they're here, but I'm sure it has something to do with the Institute. It would be a treat to have a crack at the Brotherhood's robotics technology. Instead, I have to relegate myself to this sorry excuse for a laboratory. Skara sounds like she's a fan of the Brotherhood of Steel. In fact, later in the game we have the option to recruit her for the Brotherhood. If for some reason we anger the Institute before recruiting Dr. Madison Lee to work on Liberty Prime, we can still get the giant robot up and running by coming here to the Science Center and recruiting Professor Skara. However, if instead we manage to successfully recruit Dr. Madison Lee, Professor Skara stays here, not so patiently enduring the company of Dr. Duff. However, things are not quite as hopeless as they seem. Heading upstairs, we notice that there is only one bed. And if we come back at night, we find Scala and Duff sleeping in the same bed. We walk away with the impression that despite how annoyed Professor Scala is at Dr. Duff, she may be staying for more personal reasons rather than professional ones. At any rate, we need to go find ourselves a bloatfly gland, and these are pretty doggone easy to find. One of the best places to go is the Greater Mass Blood Clinic, just south of Fort Hagen. As we get close, we find bloatflies flying about just outside. And heading inside, we find some blood bug hatchlings. There's a military checkpoint nearby. I ignored it to explore this place, but some sort of battle went on the entire time I was here. We'll head on over to explore what's going on in just a minute. On this first floor, we see a rubble ramp that leads up to the second floor, but checking behind it first, we find a skeleton and a duffel bag. Inside, we find some randomized loot, including a cryogenic grenade, which is fairly rare. Before going upstairs, we can finish exploring this first floor. Looks like this was a waiting room just outside reception. There's a door leading to a delivery area. Here we find a ruined van with the skeleton of a military serviceman in the back. There's a hardened sniper rifle right next to him. Back inside and exploring reception, we find some pre-war money and a few chems. And we hear this constant buzzing. Looking above us, we find another bloatfly. 
Because there are so many holes in the walls and floors of this place, the insects infesting it will fly between the floors, making it difficult to maintain fire on them. The rest of the first floor is blocked off by collapsed floors and walls, so to finish exploring we need to head out and go around back where we can go through a broken wall to explore a storage room. Here we find some stim packs and another skeleton sitting in a chair. This leads to a staircase that brings us to the second floor, and again we hear this incessant buzzing sound. Rounding a corner, we get rid of a blood bug just in time to kill a blood fly. That's where I call a confirmed kill. We find a rubble ramp in one room leading to the roof, but before we explore it, we can go into the adjacent room where we find a blood clinic key lying on a desk. On the ground next to this is a cooler with a Nuka-Cola cherry inside. There's the skeleton of a woman sitting on a couch next to some glowing fungus, and the rest of this floor is really deteriorated. Lots of holes everywhere, but if we can navigate between them, we find a security door in the southeastern corner of this building. We can hack this terminal, but there's also a key that we can find, so let's turn around and come back to this door in a minute. Going back to that room with the rubble ramp, we can go on top of the roof. Looks like scavengers or raiders had set up camp up here at one time. We find a cooler in the corner, a bed in the northwestern corner with a cap stash on the ground and a duffel bag, and then a stash of shotgun shells next to a shotgun and an ammo box on the other end of the roof. Now jumping down, there was something we missed. From the lobby, we can peer through a crack in the floor to see another room below. There must be a basement. To access it, we can head out and go around to the western side of the building where we find a door. We can unlock this with the blood clinic key we found on the second floor. Inside, we find a skeleton on the ground, but turning left into the adjacent room, we find an exam room terminal locked with a novice lock. After hacking it, we find two logs. The first, Blood Test Protocol, explains how this clinic went about conducting blood tests. Last updated, May 5th, 2077. Step 1. Reassure the patient of confidentiality. Step 2. Draw blood per test order. Step 3. Dismiss the patient. Step 4. Forward blood to the analysis lab on the second floor. If no aids are available, clearly mark the incoming sample and deposit them in one of the lab refrigerators. Password, KJT540. This is the password we need to open up the security door we found on the second floor. In the next one, we find some test logs. Each of these logs represents a different patient. In the first one, patient 2092, we learned that this was the log for the commanding officer of Fort Hagen, General George M. Martine. He came here to the clinic to have some routine blood work done. The results found that he had elevated blood glucose and cholesterol consistent with prior test results. The clinic says that he has a high risk for diabetes. They recommend weight loss, dietary improvement, and exercise. Humorously though, we find a note Per standing orders, report the commanding officer's health as excellent. <laughs> well, the general didn't want any information getting out that might compromise his post here. The next entry was about Sergeant James R. Justice. This was also routine blood work, and they found that Justice had a vitamin D deficiency and high blood pressure consistent with high-stress technical work. They recommended some rest and relaxation. Interestingly, we find a note, results reported to the HR command for evaluation. This seems to contradict their own procedure. They would talk to their patients about privacy and confidentiality, but the results of this blood work would then be sent to HR command. Looks like the top brass would make decisions about a soldier's future based on these blood results, which may be why the general didn't want his results being disclosed. The next patient, Ethan Thomas, had a pediatric blood culture done. The results were negative. The patient is likely suffering from the flu. They recommended bed rest, fluids, and plan to recheck in two days if the fever was unchanged. At the end, we see a note, instruct the aides to sanitize teddy bear. I believe this tells us that Ethan Thomas was a child. Plus, his procedure was a pediatric blood culture. He might have been one of the children of the soldiers stationed in or around Fort Hagen. He had the flu, which is why they would want to sanitize the teddy bear. But I guess this means that the clinic itself owned the teddy bear and gave it to Ethan to comfort him during his procedure. In the next one, we learned that Private Caesar M. Lopez came in for a standard STD check. His results were negative. He did not have STDs. 
Well, this is great news, but I wonder why Caesar wanted to get tested for STDs. Well, we find out in the next one. Here we learn that Alexis J. Martin came into the clinic to have a paternity test done. Martin, we remember that last name. That was the last name of General George, the commanding officer of Fort Hagen. I guess that means that Alexis was his wife. The two of them must have been excited to bring a new child into the world. Let's see what the results of this paternity test were. The results were that the DNA test they performed closely matched patient 2490. It was a 90% match. This patient, Alexis Martin, was reassured of confidentiality. Note, results again reported to the commanding officer per standing orders, her husband, General Martin. But the father came back as patient 2498. Taking a look at the patient logs, that's not the number of her husband, George. That's the number of Cesar Lopez. Oh no, Alexis had an affair with Private Cesar Lopez, possibly a one-night stand. This left Cesar wondering about whether or not he contracted an STD, and it left Alexis pregnant. But to make matters worse, the paternity test was forwarded directly to her husband, who likely immediately learned of his wife's infidelity. The final one is interesting. The log number is 0000, has no name, no procedure, and no results. But it does have a note. Kyle, I've stashed the chems in the blood storage room in the basement. They're in a cooler in the second fridge. Third row, bottom shelf. The contact expects them tonight. Don't be late. Wipe this message. Well, since this message wasn't wiped, I believe we can assume that this pickup was scheduled for October 23rd, 2077. It never happened because the bombs dropped, which means we should find the chems still in that cooler. Looks like some of the employees here were taking some of the chems from this clinic and selling them on the black market. We find a few chems in this room, and in an adjacent room we find a bed with two skeletons on it. One a serviceman, and one a woman in a dress. Were these two sharing a bed the moment the bombs dropped? And what's a bedroom doing in a blood draw clinic? We know that both Sergeant Lopez and Alexis had been here. Could these be the remains of the lovers, Lopez and Alexis? But now I'm interested in this cooler, so heading out, we can go through a southern door where we find a staircase to the basement. Going forward, we hear the unmistakable flap of wings, and in the next room, find a whole bunch of bugs. Strangely, they didn't attack when I walked in. I must have been super stealthy. Winding through the wrecked rooms, we reach one room filled with all sorts of terminals and consoles. On the table, we find another copy of the blood clinic key. So if we didn't get the one on the second floor, we can always get this one. And right next to it on the same table is a short syringer rifle. And we can press a big red button against the wall to open up a sealed door. Here we find the blood storage refrigerators and inside a whole bunch of blood packs. Each of these refrigerators has blood packs inside. After leading the whole room, you can walk away with 36 of them. There's also an end of dungeon steamer trunk in the corner filled with randomized loot. We find the chem cooler that was mentioned in the terminal at the bottom of one of the refrigerators. Inside, we find a stash of chems. But now that we have the password, we can head back up to the second floor and use it to unlock the terminal to the sealed lab. Inside, we find two more blood storage refrigerators. We have to close the door to access one of them, and we can loot even more blood packs from inside. We can use the blood clinic key to unlock the safe lying here, which has ammunition and more randomized loot inside. And here we find a chemistry station and a bunch of chems on a cabinet behind the desk. We find a skeleton slumped over in the chair of this desk and on the desk, a copy of Massachusetts Surgical Journal, Cryotechnology, Haven or Tomb. We now permanently inflict 2% more limb damage. Next to the magazine is a terminal that we can unlock with the same password we found in the basement. Here we can open the safe. We find two notes and a notice. Your blood analysis software license has expired. Please contact your technology or procurement supervisor for assistance. In the first one, review standing orders. On January 2nd, 2076, all results from General Martine to be coded as normal or excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this guy is doing a good job to protect himself. April 1st, 2077, all abnormal results from base personnel to be batched to HR command for evaluation. 
Is there anything significant about this being April Fool's Day? It's disturbing, though, to learn that private information about their blood was being sent to the top brass for evaluation. Their bosses were making decisions about their futures in the military based on their blood work. In the final one, just a few days before the bombs dropped, on October 21st, 2077, all results from Mrs. Martin's blood work to be forwarded to the general at his request. So the general was suspicious of his wife. He knew his wife was coming here for the paternity test. And then he abused his position of authority here at the base to gain access to the lab results, whereupon he learned that his wife had an affair. He not only could use this as leverage in a divorce, but he could also ruin the career of Lopez. Of course, the affair is not a good thing. His wife isn't really a class act for cheating on him, but this abuse of power and trust on his part is still inexcusable. The final note allows us to analyze blood samples. We can access the analysis software, but when the software tries to verify the license, it fails. Your software license expired 2,512 months ago. Please contact your technology or procurement supervisor for assistance. Well, that makes sense. It has been 200 years. I'm sure the license has long expired. After fully exploring the clinic, we can finally head south to figure out exactly what all this commotion was about. These guys have been fighting for 10 plus minutes, and we find that it's just two death claws. <laughs> This makes me wonder about how these checkpoint encounters function. We heard all sorts of explosions and gunfire going on for a full 10 minutes, but when we finally arrived, we didn't find any bodies, and there were only two death claws here. At any rate, once we have some glands, we can head back to the science center and turn them in to Dr. Duff. Hi. Hello there. Um, did you need something? Don't you remember me? No, can't say I do. Did you need something from the science center? You were the one who sent me on a field trip. Hmm, I don't recall. That might have been before or after I had to vent out an awful lot of semi-toxic gas from the lab. Maybe if you were more specific? Never mind. I'm leaving. Alrighty then. Take care. Yeah, I have this bloat fly gland. You asked for it. Oh, the field trip, of course! Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Let me just take that. These glands are definitely the product of adaptation to radioactive exposure. Maybe our own insides have adapted as well. <gasps> Wouldn't that be something? Here's a little reward for my new junior scientist. <laughs> she didn't even remember us. All right, there's something definitely off about Dr. Duff. And we never learn exactly what kind of experiments either of them do. Dr. Duff is clearly working with volatile chemicals of some sort. But at least the doctors have each other and are safe here in Diamond City to continue whatever crazy experiments they have to do. And that is the full story of the Science Center in Diamond City and the Greater Mass Blood Clinic near Fort Hagen. Yet another reminder of the corruption and lack of basic humanity that went on in pre-war America before the bombs dropped. Did you discover the Science Center in your gameplay? Did you work with Dr. Madison or Dr. Scala to get Liberty Prime up and running? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. I take Sundays off, so I'm not going to have a video for you on Monday, but never fear, I'll have a brand new video for you Tuesday morning. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you bright and early Tuesday morning with a brand new video.